You are now listening to the Hunter's Advantage Podcast. We preserve the history and sport of hunting through curious conversation and action-packed hunts, as well as offering you tips and strategy for more successful hunts. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Hunter's Advantage Podcast. This is episode number 167. We're joined by an absolute hunting legend, Jackie Bushman from Buckmasters. Thanks for uh, thanks for jumping on with me, Jackie. Oh, my pleasure, Christian. Uh, this is Friday, so uh, it's five o'clock somewhere. So uh, I'm glad to be with you. <laughs> so let's um let's start here. I mean, most folks that have been hunting or not living under a rock have heard of Buckmasters. What was it that that kind of drove you to start that in in 1989? Can you give a little bit of background into that? Sure. Well, Ray Scott was a good friend of mine from Montgomery, Alabama. Started the Bassmasters, and uh, Ray and I were in a hunting club together, and he always told me how he started Bassmasters. And from that conversation, uh, I really wanted to do something for deer hunt similar to what he did to the bass fishermen. So uh, we started Buckmasters. I think it was 1986 is when we started it and uh we got going for two or three years and then the tv show started the full length tv show started in 1989 and then we got a pilot on 1988 so uh yeah we've been doing this thing a long time when it came over with the arc and helping separate the animals that's how long we've been doing it <laughs> That's awesome. So, Jackie, I know that you're from Alabama. When did you grow up hunting whitetail primarily, or were you kind of a do it all outdoorsman when you growing up? Well, I, I'm, I'll be honest with you, I was a small game hunter. I started my grandfather from Rome, Georgia, got me going and, you know, I hunted and rabbit hunted. All of our friends, you know, had a little old hunting club we would go to. And, uh, uh, I really got the bug uh, after I shot my first when I was 15. When I shot my, my first buck, he was a six inch spike from Myrtlewood, <laughs> Alabama. I'll never forget that. Deer. And, you know, I, people ask me that question all over the country. Hey, what's your favorite deer? What's your favorite? And they're, they're thinking it might be the Alberta buck that I shot, 190 something inches. No, it's my Alabama six inch spike. That's my favorite buck because it's my first one. Well, none of those other ones would ever came if you didn't have the one to get you into it. Exactly. And, uh, you know, and it just, it thrills me, you know, to take some new people hunting. We've got a program called Share the Hunt USA that we did last year. Going to be kicking it off this year really big, too. But, you know, to watch somebody shoot their first deer and see their reaction and the way their heart's beating and, their, you know, they're breathing heavy. But I just remember it like it was yesterday. And I can promise you, if 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 every deer hunter out there would take somebody new to the woods and experience their experience of getting their first deer, I'm telling you, it's priceless. Number two, it would help license sales across the country. And our sport could always flourish because you're paying it forward, which I think, you know, if I never shoot another deer, but I've got my seven-year-old grandson who I took last year. He got close, but this year, hopefully, he'll get one. Those are the things that I look forward to. I took a doctor who saved my life in the emergency room and never shot a gun before, big fisherman. I took him out, and I started him at 11 o'clock in the afternoon, Dr. Kim. And we started shooting a gamo air rifle. Then we went to a, a Savage A-17. Then we went to... Uh, a 308 uh, Savage, and he shot his first deer at five o'clock that first afternoon. So I'm really into that part of it. I just want everybody to enjoy the sport and, and feel the feeling that I felt when I was 15 years old. Yeah, and it it takes people that are willing to sacrifice some of their time and honestly some of their hunting experience to do that. I mean, I think about my dad and my uncle who took me to get my first deer, and yeah. man, there was there was probably a six, seven, eight year period of time with me and my three brothers where my dad didn't shoot many deer, but he's got yeah. three people that are ate up with deer hunting now as a result. And I promise you, I've got, I've, uh, I've passed that along. I've got some people involved too. And that's how it works. We have to have that full circle moment to keep it going. No question. 
when so when did you start when did you start doing that have you kind of always been into into taking people or is that some, somewhat of a new experience for you well we've been doing it for a long time but i wanted to put it on television and um you know we started taking our 4h we got a program with aces uh here uh in alabama with the 4h program we started taking some 4h kids we've taken probably now 9,000 disabled folks out to the field through Buckmasters. Mm -hmm. We've taken 900 terminally ill kids out and getting their first deer, taking 500 wounded soldiers. So we've been involved in that for 30 something years. Uh, it's just a simple concept. You know, everybody should take their family hunt, you know, and, and expose them. But how many people maybe at church or at the ball field or at work who don't have access to the outdoors, don't have a property to go to, maybe thought about it, but nobody really asked them to do it. Those are the people that I would highly encourage, you know, you invite because you'd be shocked of how many people might go if you ask. Them. But again, what you're giving up, you're giving up your time. Okay. I get, it. you know, you might be on a hunting leash. You go, golly, I paid a lot of money. Okay. I get that. But if you think about the positives you can get out of it, you know what I'm saying? If you're on a management program, you got to shoot a lot of does. They don't have to shoot a buck. Just take them out and let them shoot a dove if they want to. Take them squirrel hunting. Take them quail hunting. Take them rabbit hunting. Just get them out to enjoy our outdoor lifestyle. That's what it's about. And uh, if they can branch into it, I know Dr. Kim shooting his first deer, okay? He's already bought, I bet you, $5,000 equipment now. He's in. He's in. So now he wants to go hunt. So you'd be surprised at the economic impact of taking somebody hunting that gets into it. Because you and I know hunting a, is, a, is a fun sport, but you got a lot of props you got to get to, right? That's right. Yeah, I uh, in a world of, you know, QDM and, and people wanting to shoot bigger and bigger bucks, it seems like I always get really encouraged by people's selflessness of, of taking – people out because it kind of seems just even in my limited perspective of the last decade of kind of being an adult and being in the the uh, community i see you know people are more and more secretive and holding on tight and fast as lease prices go up as land prices go up so to see people that are willing to share that resource with others it just makes me feel like those people get it no question and you know i'm all about the big deer but what's happened is this big deer philosophy has taken over a lot of the thrill of, you know, somebody shooting their first buck. You know, some people don't live in the Midwest. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they're very blessed to live there. Here in Alabama, I mean, she was six inch spike or seven point, you know, swamp buck. I mean, a 200 pounders is the biggest bucks we got. You know what I'm saying? So I always tell everybody, don't take the fun out of the sport. By you know, just getting trophy, trophy, trophy. Everybody's dream is to shoot their dream trophy buck. We all have it. I have it. You have it. But let's don't let it just overtake the deer hunting experience. And that's what I've tried to preach for 37 years of television. Yeah, that's right. I mean, when you were coming up, you know, really hunting deer um, big in the 80s, 90s, and, you know, still till today, was the big deer philosophy around back then? Or is it this somewhat of a new phenomenon i think it's kind of come in uh you know the last probably 10 to 15 years really worked really hit heavy you know what i'm saying so um and there's been a lot of deer you know a lot of bigger deer shot over the years hunters have gotten smarter the equipment's gotten better you know so uh it, it's amazing it's no different than the fishing you know there's more bigger bass or bigger blue marlins called uh technology and more people in the field, uh, you know, these big bucks, they're smart. They're the smartest game animal there is, but they can make a mistake. And, you know, and they're going on the wall. And there's just a lot more ways. You know, somebody asked me the other day, what do you think the biggest uh, piece of equipment of taking deer? It's the trail camera, if you want to know the truth. You can go out and see a rub or a scrape and go, man, and you see how high he's rubbing. Like, a pretty good deer, what it is. Trail cam really told everybody what's on their property. You know, the size deer and stuff like that. I don't know if they're bad, but I'm just saying, there seems to me been a lot more big deer shots since the invention of the trail cam. 
And that's just my opinion. And my opinion is only my opinion. Yeah, that's well, I remember talking to my uncle and dad who did a lot of hunting, you know, eighties, nineties, early two thousands when I got into it. And, you know, they, they talk about the number of deer not being nearly as good and the size of the deer just flourishing over as people under started to understand age class and, um, maybe nutrients and, and passing. And it just seems like everything in the, like we're in, I heard a lot of folks at the national deer association saying it like, this mm -hmm. is the golden days of whitetail hunting with numbers, with rack size and all that stuff. So I don't know. It's a good time to be a deer hunter. I think though, too. Oh, no question. Cause in the early 1900s, we only had maybe a half a million deer. Now we got 28 million deer across the country. And uh, that that's a true testament to the the conservation part of our sport. You know, not only do we take care of the deer, but all the animals we're taking care of. And I think that's where the management comes in because you have to shoot those. Because what's happening is is we get our as these big cities keep growing, it's taking away a lot of our terrain and habitat for the deer. So it's our job as a conservationist to make sure and you know, our game and fish guys do such a wonderful job in their knowledge of, of setting game limits uh, of how many deer you can take per state. So I think it's just been a joint effort of of learning uh, what we have to do to manage our, our whitetail, but in, in the bag limits and stuff like that. So, and, and now what protein to give to the deer. So we're feeding the deer more than we've ever fed the deer. You know, they've always had their natural food sources, but now with the supplement food sources of the proteins and calciums and things like that, that, you know, companies have, you know, flourished being in the seed and, you know, uh, business and also the supplement business. But it's, it's an interesting uh, deal to watch it grow uh, in the last 37 years that I've been involved in. It's, it's cool stuff, really. Has. One of the things that I, uh, Another angle that I really like that's happening in the deer hunting community is, and even um, outside of it, is like this sustainable way of living, of like knowing where your food comes from. And I, I've always kind of thought that as a deer hunter, you know, hey, that's a no brainer. But it seems like more and more folks are jumping on that bandwagon, you know, whether it's all the preservatives that are in our food, all the stuff that's in our water, just knowing that everything's basically trying to poison us in this world and knowing where your food comes from. And hey, uh, if people want to, if they want to know that I've got the solution for them. And, and it's a, uh, on the other side of shooting a whitetail deer. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, venison, I mean, wow. It's a great piece of meat. There's no question. There's no fat, no cholesterol. And you know, when we're able to give it to a lot of the needy folks in nursing homes and things like that, that, that don't have, you know, a, enough meat and stuff to feed their nursing homes. It's been a perfect, uh, uh, meat. If you cook it, cook it right. Venison is as good as anything there is out there. I promise you that. And elk's even better than uh, venison. I I'm trying to get me one of those. My my wife is on me about going and getting her an elk after we had some of those steaks, and that's on the list. I've had it at a game supper at my church. All the blue hair ladies, what I call them down here in the south. We, kind of, <laughs> we didn't put name tags, you know, on the meat like we normally did. We just put, you know, like a uh, back strap or whatever or loin or something like that. And they were going after that elk loin like you've never seen anything. That's the best beef I've ever had. And I let them eat and everything. And I just said, ladies, if that's the best meat you've ever had, you just ate elk steak. And they just sat there and they stunned. They went, that's the best thing I've ever had. I said, hey, try to tell you all that. So uh, it is what it is. <laughs> I've, in, I've invited people that, you know, maybe not anti hunting, they just kind of kind of indifferent about it over to eat. And I think that's one of the best ways to share hunting with people is over a meal. And we, I made some chicken fried backstrap and people said they wouldn't eat deer meat. And I watched people one, they were double fisting one in each hand and just hand over hand over hand eating it. And they're like, what is that? And I said, that's, that's backstrap. That's venison backstrap. It's one of the best meats you'll ever eat. And they were like, that's incredible. I want to kill a deer now. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you're right. You're right because the non-hunters <clears throat> are the folks that really will uh, determine uh, our future as sports. So, you know, the animal rights people will always be the animal rights people. There's ten percent of them. Their 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 bark is a lot, you know, louder than their bite. But you gotta 
they're very good at marketing to people and it's a lot easier to market folks not to hunt than it is to hunt, but it's the non hunters out there. If you just, and Jeff Fox is a good friend. So just give me five minutes to sit down that somebody that has common sense and let us explain to you what the outdoor lifestyle is all about. Let's explain to them what the Pittman Robertson act does and you know, all the taxes and what it goes back into to our game agencies to, developing our wildlife and how do you keep them sustained and stuff. So once you tell them the story, they might not ever go hunting or fishing, but they might understand what we do and they sure can enjoy the venison and the stuff we cook. So I think the education of the non hunter is probably our biggest uh, thing that we need to do as hunters. And, uh, and we try to, we've tried to do that at Buckmasters now for 37 years and hopefully we've made a difference in, in getting the message out because, you know, my grandfather got me started when I was eight or nine years old uh, and I got the hook. He hooked me and I, I've loved it ever since. Uh, the older I get, I guess I get more passionate of knowing there's a day I might not be able to go. I might be up there in the pearly gates hunting something else uh, uh, of the deer in heaven, but I, I really am. I'm just eating up with the outdoors. I, I love to go. Uh, I still have the passion to go. And, uh, I just hope everybody enjoys it as much as I do because it's a great sport. Share it with as many people as you can. Yeah, it seems that to me that there's a, a better balance that we can strike with trying to get people involved, especially in the, the eating side of, of, of hunting because, like, I see a lot of folks. I'm, I'm Sometimes I'm really social media, you know, simple. Or take the attitude of, you know, if you don't, like hunting and if you don't like eating it you can kiss my butt and there's other people that have a little bit more of a delicate approach kind of as we would as believers you know you're not going to beat somebody over the head with the bible but you're just going to continue to show them um what the truth is and i, I think we could just as an overall community you guys do a really good job of it but i think we could do a better job of kind of bringing people into that without telling them if you don't like it you can you can kick rocks well i think messaging is and how you message has always uh, been important uh, I'm a little more on the softer tone than I am on the hard tone because, uh, you know, we get it, but a lot of folks don't. A lot of these folks that live in the inner cities don't really understand what we do. But I can promise you this. Anybody that I've taken hunting or fishing for the first time, I haven't, any, haven't seen one person that didn't enjoy the experience. And that's the truth. Get, get away from all the animal rights, all the literature and all, you know, like I said, they, they've got a loud megaphone. So it's easy to get their message over. Okay. But give me five minutes with somebody. Let me take them hunting or fishing, show them what we do. And I haven't seen one person that didn't get it. Now, did they continue to do it? Don't know. Some of them jumped into it, but at least they understood what the hunting sportsmen and fishermen were doing. Because let's put it this way. The animal rights folks has never put one cent into conservation. All of our species are conserved by the hunting sportsmen and fishermen. It's our dollars that keep it. The fastest growing sport in the country is bird watching. Okay. And that's funded by us, the hunters. No animal rights group has ever funded the conservation of our wildlife animals. That's a fact. That's very true. That, I mean, you know, everybody, everybody has a, a mouth and an opinion, but other people are writing checks. And I mean, the outdoor community is the one putting billions of dollars into the economy to make sure that we're hunting from this generation to the next and preservation of those animals. So we're the, like you said, the guys going in and spending $5,000 a week after they get into hunting, that makes a big difference. Everything they buy, there's an excise tax that goes back to the wildlife agencies to help conserve all of our wildlife species. So it's pretty simple. You know, the white-tailed deer being, you know, as I said, from the early 1930s, 500,000 to 28 million. The hunters only take four or five million deer a year, and there's 11 to 12 million deer hunters out there. Now, not every deer hunter is getting a deer. But what you have to understand is a white-tailed deer stands about three foot at the back. They're consuming all the food sources on the forest floor. So if you do not conserve and take X amount of does and X amount of bucks, which your wildlife agencies will tell you, that affects everything from squirrels to rabbits to birds or anything else is trying to eat the food source on the forest floor. And as I said, as these big cities keep growing, 
the land capacity for our animals gets smaller and smaller. So you have to have control recreational hunting to try to keep our animals in balance. And that is the thing that the conservation movement has been so good at and something I'm very proud of. So if you can explain that message, it it's a lot easier to understand. And like I said, the fastest growing sport in the country is bird watching. And we fund it. End of story. Drop the mic. Boop. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, I did want to talk to you. Uh, you mentioned in the opener of the show how um, you know you guys started the TV show in 1989. What was it like and what was the driver for starting a hunting television show in, in the late 80s? Well, I'll tell you, you know, if I had to do it again, I might have stayed in the tennis business. So uh, <laughs> my, my hero growing up, and you're probably too young, but there was a show called The American Sportsman. And it was Kurt Gowdy and Grits Gresham. It was on ABC. And they ran for 23 years. And uh, it took – I played sports all my life. We had one television. So the only thing that would get me inside was American sports. And they were hunting and fishing and doing that. And I'm, I'm fortunate that Grits Gresham – but. Ray Scott, as I mentioned when Bassmasters told me, he said, hey, you need to try to do a TV show. That's very important uh, to – to get the message out and get people to join Buckmasters and, and things like that. So um, there'd never been a deer hunting show on major cable television. So um, when I was picking up the phone and calling the networks, they said, you're going to do a deer hunting show. And I said, yes, and they'd hang up. And I went to three different networks. It was a pretty quick conversation. It was like, wow. Uh, you know, fishing, they would do hunting. They didn't want to do. So I was doing a promotional event uh, called the Buckmasters classic which was similarly set up to the NBC superstars event. And um, way back, NBC had a deal called the superstars where they had athletes that were doing track and field and things like that. So I basically looked at that concept, flipped it to an outdoors concept. So we had knife throwing, hatchet throwing, skeet shooting, ATV uh, obstacle course, we had bow and arrow golf. We had an outdoors kind of themed event. That I had people like Bo Jackson and Dale Earnhardt and Wade Boggs and Jeff Foxworthy, along with Buckmaster members in the outdoor press. And I called the networks and I said, this is what I want to do. They said, no hunting in? I said, absolutely, no hunting. It's just an event with outdoor participation. And the folks at the Nashville Network bought into it. They said, look, we'll air it. Uh, we'll air it on Sunday nights at 10 o'clock in October of 1988. And I was still teaching tennis at that time. And that was Sunday night. And I was teaching tennis on Monday morning. And by the uh, Mr. Mendel, Mr. Mendel, who was the head chairman of Kindercare Corporation, which was basically funding Buckmaster, said, hey, there's a corporate plane that has flown in from Nashville. They would like to meet with you. And I'm still soaking wet from my tennis lesson. I go into the big boardroom in there at Kindercare, and there's the four execs from the Nashville Network. They said, young man, we want to sit down and talk to you about doing the first hunting show on major cable television. The pilot show we just ran last night was the highest rated show we've ever had on the network. And hey, I'll just say this right off the bat. In 37 years later, it wasn't because of me and my great acting ability. I can promise you that. It was the it was the outdoor lifestyle fun that people wanted to see on television. And once we put that out there, CNN got it. They're good old country folks and country music and stuff. They got it. And then we were off to the races. But I will tell you this, hunting whitetails with a camera back in those days, the cameras couldn't pick up the abundant light that you needed to get them on camera. That's probably one reason nobody did a deer hunt show. Because um, I ended up doing my first shows in Texas because Texas, the deer would come out at least in, in daylight. So to give you an idea, if you're hunting in the morning and it's breaking day, we're 30 minutes after prime time before we can turn that camera on. The famous two words of my cameraman were don't shoot in the early days. <laughs> Why? We don't have any light. I had more big deer standing under me at 10 yards that I couldn't shoot. And I couldn't, it just, boy, that really bothered me. And then in the afternoon, you know, the last 30 minutes prime time, we were through, the camera was out. So now 37 years later, the camera's, don't weigh but about three or four pounds when they in the old days they weighed about 25 pounds 
They also cost about $50,000 and the new cameras are so much lighter and they cost about three to $5,000 with HD. So I've seen the camera technology really improve over the years. And now those deer that they say don't shoot, basically the cameras can see better than my eyes. So the technology of, of, of video and now, and we created the first tree arm uh, because my first cameraman, Gene Bottlesbacher, who to me, the best cameraman in the country for whitetails, would stand up with a 25 pound camera on his shoulder. But the problem is the footage. I mean, as good as Gene, as steady as he was, it's just not steady footage. So we designed a tree arm that you would uh, put the camera on top of, and that would keep the camera steady. And we could rotate it around the trees and stuff as the deer were coming on both sides. So my gosh, has it been a learning curve. Uh, and the hours we spend in the field just to try to get 17 minutes, you know, that's what the editorial of a TV show is about 17 minutes and 40 seconds. And, if, and I always tell people, they come up, if you see a lot of talking and a lot of cooking and a lot of shooting at the range, we've had a bad week. Okay. <laughs> we can get a lot of deer on camera. Okay. But we might only, and we sit, we go five days. See, everybody always asks that question. We're on location five days, no matter where we are, an hour or wherever we're going, five days to try to get 17 minutes and 40 seconds. Does that give you an idea of what we're doing? <laughs> yeah. 17 minutes and 40 seconds. Yeah. That sounds easy. I mean, we film a lot of, we film a lot of our hunts and you know, you think I'll look at my camera, my memory card. I'm like, Oh, I got an hour's worth of footage. This is going to be pretty good. I trim it down. I'm like, there's five minutes is worth even looking at here when you get it down to the bones. Bingo. <laughs> yeah. What? So, I mean, I, I, the camera stuff was, was really interesting to me. I mean, I, there's cert several situations now we have some of those really good, you know, light cameras now, and I'll use the camera now, I'll crank the ISO all the way up when I can't even see through my binos of what's going on down there. I'm like, Oh, I know, I know which buck that is. I can yep. see it now. Yep. Technology is an amazing deal. My biggest what thing is I kept looking for deer. My camera guy says there's a deer and uh, I don't know what it is about the magic age of 40. I don't know if you're there yet, but uh, I no, not, see not yet. <laughs> I couldn't see the deer and I had to go get glasses. So uh, now I can see the deer. So and I tried contact for a while, but I couldn't shoot. The Hunters Advantage podcast is powered by Out on a Limb Manufacturing. Out on a Limb is a family owned company based right here in Oklahoma that makes tree stands, saddle platforms, climbing sticks, and so much more. Christian, I have a quick question. What's that? What bites sound harder, a hippo or an alligator? No idea. It's a trick question. The Ridge Runner 2.0 bites harder than both of them. But all jokes aside, we use these products all across the land on public or private. These help us get into any tree we want and hunt where the deer actually are. Most men go to the grocery store for their meat, but these products help you go to God's grocery store. I have used the Out on a Limb Ridge Runner 2.0 and the Shakar Sticks for the last few years hunting public land bucks, and I've actually shot several bucks out of this setup. If you want to support the podcast and get some Out on a Limb equipment, make sure to go to outonalimmfg.com and use code HNTA10 for 10% off at checkout. Once again, if you want to support the podcast, Go to outonalimmfg.com and use code HNTA10 at checkout for 10% off. Now let's get back to the podcast. What are some of your you know, best or favorite memories, maybe a couple over all the years of filming the show? Are there any that, that really stick out? Oh, there's a bunch that sticks out, man. Uh, as far as my favorite hunt, I told you that. That's my that's my six inch spike in Alabama. But as far as videoing, um, I'll give you three. Okay. As far as whitetails, I would have to say the 192 inch Alberta buck that I shot in 1998 under the pivot. People will remember that he was with the doe and uh, beautiful buck. Uh, I'd never seen a drop time buck before in my life ever in my. Uh, the landowner up in Canada kept talking about all these drop times. I've never seen one in the wild. And uh, that was, to me was the coolest hunt uh, as far as whitetail. Now the two that really, that I'll never forget aren't whitetail hunts. I did a mountain lion hunt in Idaho. And like I said, I used to be a tennis professional. I was in pretty good shape in my, in my playing days. And I will say that was the toughest hunt that I've ever done before. And I was doing a bow hunt for mountain lions. And it's amazing how many people 
And we put, I got with the Idaho Game and Fish Department and had them involved in it. How many people after I did that show had no clue about mountain lion hunting? You know, they thought it was endangered species and this and that. And, uh, you know, you might want to ask the people that have lost loved ones and pets due to mountain lions because of, you know, some states outlawed mountain lion hunting. Now they've got them back in force because it's a management deal. But I broke. I think four ribs on that hunt with the snowmobile that flipped on top of me. Ooh. And then uh, just going up and down those mountains and, and stuff and being soaking wet and zero degrees, it was a dangerous, you know, deal there. You know, you couldn't stop. You had to keep running and getting back to the truck. I mean, I bet you I drank three gallons of, of Gatorade after each hunt. But uh, finally got a big cat and uh, – I went to draw back with four broken ribs and my cameraman said, stop the camera froze. And I was sitting there and I said, I don't know if I can pull it back. We finally got it on manual, the old big old heavy camera and made the shot. And that was a 180 pound mountain lion. Oh, Boone that's a monster. Boone and Crockett, buddy. And I'm telling you that that was a thrill, but the biggest hunt in the most adrenaline rush, hunt, I was a big hero of Fred Bear. When Fred Bear was left-handed, I'm left-handed. And if you go back and look at the old reels, there were, Fred Bear went out with a compound bow to Alaska. And this big grizzly comes out behind the rock at 15 yards. And with a compound bow, he center cuts him. I said, I want to do that. Don't think I want to do it on the ground, but I'd like to challenge myself and my archery, you know, people have watched me for 37 years. Uh, I'm not going to win any medals for my shooting for archery, okay? So, uh, but I just, I was in Alaska, and I did it for five years. And normally what we would do is we would wait for the salmon to come up the streams. We had tree stands. We were basically tree standing grizzly bears, you know, coming up in the salmon streams and stuff. But this one year, the salmon didn't come up, and my guide said, we're going to have to hunt the grizzlies on the beach, and there was a dead walrus that came up and we were going to sit on the walrus and the bears were coming in and, you know, hitting the walrus and stuff. And uh, I never forgot this, but I was sitting there and we tried to sit one night, but the wind was so bad coming off that walrus, we were throwing up. We had to get an east and we just had to leave. It was just terrible. So we got an east wind, which we needed. And uh, we got on that walrus the next night and, um, I had a, you know, my guy's got a gun and I got my 300, but I got my bow right here. And he's, and this grizzly comes around the corner toward the walrus. Well, he wasn't sure if he was going to go to the walrus or come by us. And if he was coming by us, I was going to turn it into a rifle hunt. If he go, went to the walrus, it was going to turn it into a bow hunt. So he, he's coming and the guy's going, walrus, get your bow. And I'm trying to get my bow. And buddy, I'm telling you, I can't tell you the, the feeling my body felt. I, you know, white tail, you get excited and nervous. When the, the top of the phone chain is 30 yards away from me, I can't express the, you know, all I know is if my hair was making my hat go up, okay? That's, that's how <laughs> nervous I was. So I grabbed the bow and I was looking, trying to get everything. And I looked up, here comes a second grizzly around the corner. So I got two grizzlies on the ground at 30 yards and my guy, and I wanted to shoot the one on the right because it looked like he was bigger. I mean, but the one on the left stayed perfectly broadside. My guy's hollering at me, shoot, shoot. So finally I made the decision to go to the one on the left. And, uh, I, you know, I just asked the Lord, you know, he's seen a lot of my archery shots over the years and they hadn't been good. I said, if you just make this one perfect, for me, you and I are going to be fine. So, uh, I fortunately made a, a good shot, but when I made the shot, the grizzly on the left was pulling meat from the walrus. So when I hit the <clears throat> when I hit the uh, bear that I shot at, the bear over here on the right side thought that bear was doing something, so he jumped over and tried to bite the other bear. My bear took off, and the second bear stood up on his hind legs and was looking right at us. And I can't tell you the feeling that was going in. Now, there's one thing about grizzly hunting that I'll teach anybody that's watching this podcast. It's picking out your guide. That's number one. Do not go into camp and pick out the guide that is the shortest, the skinniest. Go to eat a meal with them and see who stays and eats the, the most hamburgers or the most food and maybe has his gut hanging on the table. Because in that <laughs> moment, in that moment when it happens and that grizzly's coming after you and your team, 
All you got to do is be able to outrun your guy. If you do that, you win. Okay. <laughs> but I, getting that grizzly with the bear, you know, with the bow, that's top. That's tops, my tops. And, uh, and knowing I did what Fred Bear did and did it with the bow. And, you know, there's just a few hundred folks in the world that shot a grizzly with a bow. So, um, old Buckmaster finally made a good shot. But that was something I'll never forget. But we've had a great experience doing different hunts. But those three are probably the top three. Well, I just got back from – in May, I went to Saskatchewan for a black bear hunt. And yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm trying to do the, the super slam and just there all the North, the North American animals. And my wife was like, well, what's on the slam that can like that, – that are predators? And I said, black bear, grizzly, brown, mountain lion. And she was like, oh, my gosh. She said uh, – and I said, don't worry. I'm hunting the, the least dangerous one first. And I, sh <laughs> I shot a – a Pope and young black bear up there. And it, the first one I ever hunted tried to get up in the tree with me. It started to walk oh, up yeah. the platform and you know, he was almost seven foot tall. And I was like, I can't imagine one that is nine or 10 foot tall and three times the size. I mean, that is looks, it looks like an otherly worldly animal when they stand up. No question. The grizzly, I, I hadn't hunted the black bear because I just, I started at the top. The grizzly is just, Golly, is in a league of his own. Well, the polar bear is another one too, but I mean the grizzly, and you know, there's the interior grizzly, there's the Kodiak, and then there's the brown. You know, the, the, it just depends on which latitude and what food source they're feeding on. But uh, you know, the Kodiak and the browns can really get big. The interior grizzly is what I was hunting. You know, they can get up to nine foot, but most of them are seven and a half to eight and a half, something like that. But you know, they're all big to me. And like I said, they can, boy. That's a bad dude. He has no he has no predators except man. That's it. So no, even the even the black bear that that I shot. I mean, he walked in and was just huffing and puffing, laying on his. He sat down, was itching himself, rolling in the dirt, and I was like, you can tell this is the top of the food chain because this yeah. you know deer come in, they're switched on, they got ears going up every direction, they're looking, they're checking up and down. Those bear don't have a care in the world. There's nothing in there that's going to hurt them. Nope. And uh, when they come in, now I'm, you know, Saskatchewan, did you hunt where they had the different color phases? Because uh, we, we've had a lot of guys that have gone to Saskatchewan and had the different color phases. There's black, there was the bronze color, and some of them are even white looking. Yeah, no, we did. Uh, I, I shot mine 20 minutes into the hunt, and it was just a big black bear, but my buddy was hunting a cinnamon. And oh, yeah. Did, yeah, he ended up killing a black bear, but there were several cinnamons that we saw on that hunt. Yeah, there's oh, a lot cool. of color flies. Yeah. It was super cool. I just got to I, – I didn't want to fight the mosquitoes. I've been invited a bunch, and Thermosail is one of my sponsors. So I just know when we were doing the grizzly, we were using four Thermosails. The mosquitoes were so bad. So it's like you want to try to get where some wind uh, is blowing because once those mosquitoes – and we call them no-sims or black flies, that's, a, that's what will get you on those hunts. And uh, – it sure got me. I was so welted up with the with the no seams, but that thermostat helped us a little bit. But we had four of them going. Uh, those mosquitoes would land and they wouldn't fly. You just take your you take your uh, arm and you just just go across your you know sleeve and you kill thousands of them. So they're uh, they're literally so big. I feel like you could arm wrestle some of them. Absolutely. I mean, I told them. I said, just fly me on that back, and I will, you and I'll be fine. I won't have to take the flight back. So. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, <clears throat> we were up there, and our guy don't, never had a hat on, or if he did, it was backwards. And I was like, "Why do you you don't wear a hat?" And he said, "They love that brim of that hat. They get under there, and they just they love it." My guide was standing back in the bushes, just so that all the bugs wouldn't get him. I was like, "How do you live up here?" He said, "You try not to go out when they're doing this. I mean, it is bugs like you. There's not cars up there. People aren't hitting thousands of them at a time yeah. and killing them. They're just it's the wild west of bugs." Yeah. So you got to be tough to go do it. Well, congratulations on your bear, man. You get, you're young. You got plenty of time to do all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I hope so. Um, you know, maybe the pocketbook isn't, isn't the one that's lining up, but I got the time now. So I'm going to try to do some of them. Yeah. What really surprised me about Canada too, is when we were driving home, we drove into Saskatchewan in the dark. And when we drove out, it was the light. And my buddy was, kind of dozing off driving a little bit and i was like stop you're about to you're about to hit a moose and he was like moose he said that's a white-tailed doe i swear i saw a white-tailed doe that was five foot tall i mean it was bigger than most bucks that i've seen in the south it was huge it's incredible how big they get up there 
completely different species. Uh, and uh, I've really, I've been hunting up there, you know, over 30 years and just what a wonderful resource they have for all types of game. Their game and fish guys do a wonderful job and Canadian people are such nice people. And, uh, but that's where I've taken my biggest whitetails over 37 years have been in Alberta and Saskatchewan and I hunted Manitoba, uh, a little bit too, but yeah, if you hadn't done the Canadian deal, I know with the pandemic, we couldn't go, but we are back to where we can go now. But I would highly encourage folks. If you want to go shoot a big body white, I shot a, I shot a white tail that weighed 305 pounds live weight in Saskatchewan. And, you know, you know, the, those are those deep woods bucks. I mean, you know, that, you know, there's 40 below, you know, and it's, they don't have a choice. They got to put on a coat and they got to put on some meat, but I never forgot that. That deer maybe only scored 135 to 140 inches, but his, his body was the trophy 305 pounds live weight. I've never seen anything that big. The, uh, the outfitter we were with, we were about eight or nine hours North of the border and I asked him, I said, what's the biggest body deer you ever seen? Because he had some on the wall. The neck looked like a tire on him. I mean, yep. it was just insane. And he said, I've seen one shot that live weight was 370. Oh. And yeah, he said, he said that he had a guy pass a 170 inch deer that he thought was in the low thirties because that deer was over 300 pounds. Yeah. It just dwarfs a rack, of, you know, and just the way the neck and stuff is. I mean, you know, to live in that kind of terrain, you you got to put on some weight. But it's a different species too. But it hooked me when I started going up there. Uh, my logo buck that's on my hat right here. That's the that's my first uh, record book deer, and shot him in uh, Alberta on the Battle River right there. And uh, once I shot that deer, I was hooked on Canada. It, it was just you knew where the big deer were. Now, hey, the Midwest here in the States, we have a lot of big deer too, no less. But I don't know, just something about the cold weather and the snow and the terrain and those big old bucks stepping out is just something I never forgot. So, uh, you know, it's, it's not as cold as it used to be. Man, I'm telling you, back in back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, man, like 30 and 40 below was like an automatic and you had to have special clothes, special boots and stuff to really survive. So I learned how to do that just being an old Southern boy, you know, you know, thin blood i had i look like people say man you're a lot smaller in person you're on to you i said you've been watching canadian shows because the michelin <laughs> man had nothing on me i can tell you that <laughs> yeah um when, when we were up there the guide was telling us you know they a lot of times they like to sit all day you know the deer density is super low where they're hunting he said there's more bear yeah. per square mile than there are deer but you know the deer yeah. that are there get huge and he said he'll have people that they won't hunt one or two hours a day when they come in December. It's like they physically can't, they have heater body suits. They have all of it. They're just not used to hunting. He said 30 or 40 below that happens every year. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, when I first went, man, I mean, I had everything that the catalogs, you know, would say, Oh, you know, minus degrees and all that. Shoot. That's catalog clothes last for about 10 minutes. And you had to get the, uh, we, we were basically wearing stuff that the, North Pole weathermen were wearing, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And it was a certain brand of clothes and a certain kind of boot. And uh, because you couldn't sit out there all day. I never forget I went to camp and then we had some boys from Texas in there. And they were saying, Oh, there's that buckmaster guy. I guarantee he ain't gonna sit all day from dark to dark. And that kind of ticked me off a little bit. So um those boys come out about 10 o'clock and they got on a plane and went home. And uh I, it was 40 below, the wind was blowing 20 miles an hour, but uh I had the right clothes on and I made it all the way through. But I tell you, uh, sitting dark to dark, you try to, I used to do a, a deal where I had a, a butter finger that was probably one of those extra large butter fingers. Mm -hmm. And I'd take, a bite, I'd take a bite out of it every hour. And that would get me through the day. It's just, I couldn't wait. But if you start looking at your watch and you've only, you know, looked at it, you know, every 10 minutes, you got a long sit right there. You, you won't have much fun sitting out there, but you don't see many deer. But, buddy, when, when the man steps in there, you forget about all that sitting because you could have a 300-pounder and 200-inch deer, you know, very easily coming in. So, cool play. It, it is. It, it surprised me that there were – it gave me a hope that, you know, I live in Texas now. I'm from Oklahoma. Um, yeah. You see a lot of these big cities, and you think, man, they're like, you can't get away from people. And you go up there, you couldn't find a person if no. you wanted to. <laughs> And when you find one, they want to talk to you for about three hours. 
Yeah. Which is fine. Yeah. I mean, you know, we enjoy having them. The big one little coffee shop that everybody can go to and stuff. But, uh, you know, if, if you, if I, I'd highly encourage folks, if you hadn't, if you hadn't gone north of the border, uh, I mean, you talk about deer hunting, duck hunting. I mean, they've got, they've got everything you would thoroughly enjoy doing. And, uh, I would highly recommend it. So, you know, be, being in this and hunting, you know, probably over 40 years, do you, you still have the same fire to go after deer and all these other species that you, that you did, you know, oh, yeah. is it as strong as ever? It's just strong. I don't like the traveling like I used to, you know, the airlines and stuff like that. And just that, that's the only part. But when I get there, I'm ready to go. And I still get it. I, I get more excited now getting older than I did when I was younger. Okay. And you know, you got to make the shot, and, you know, take a few deep breaths and chill out. But no, I mean, when, when I, when I quit getting that feeling, I'll quit. But I hadn't, I hadn't got there yet. So, you know, when I look through my glasses, nothing's changed. When I look in the mirror, something's changed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. I got a little bit quieter hair and I got a few more wrinkles right here, but my passion and my heart for the sport, it hadn't dwindled. So, and, uh, and my buddy Bill Dance is 83, and I'm a lot younger than him, and he's still catching which one to go. So if he can do it, I'm going to keep doing it. As long as the fans enjoy the show and, you know, and, you know, if they get to where they don't enjoy me, enjoy the show, you know, I'll be, I can be like, I love Lucy. Just put me in the syndication. Y'all can just watch all the old stuff, okay? So, yep. But I do – I still enjoy it, and I, I enjoy the fans, and I appreciate all the comments and a lot of the constructive criticism we've had over the year, but – I learned a long time ago, there's a lot more better deer hunters out there that just don't do a TV show, and that's the truth. There's some good old boys out there that shot a lot more bigger bucks than I'll ever do in my lifetime. They just don't do a TV show. So I kind of went the entertainment route and having fun and cutting up on the TV show. And shoot, my, my highest rated shows were the deer, you know, the shows that I missed a deer, and I did that pretty regularly. So uh, we just try to entertain and get people ready for, for the hunting season and make it a family show where everybody can watch. And uh, as I said, this is going into our 37th year and uh, longest hunting show in TV history. So I'll keep plugging as long as the folks keep watching and I'll keep screwing up and I hope I don't teach them too many bad tricks. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. What role do you think keeping, keeping your in intentions pure with the filming aspect, like plays into keeping that fire going? Because I feel like, a lot of folks, you know, there's people nowadays, a lot of people will shoot for content. You know, they got to shoot a deer this year because they want something on video or they want to shoot the biggest buck to show other people they're shooting the biggest buck. I mean, has just keeping your intentions pure and just being having a love for sport, is, do you think that's what's kind of sustained you for the four, almost 40 years? Well, that's what I thought do. I mean, you know, I guess I have to shoot a deer on show. I mean, I, enjoy, I like I said, I enjoy doing. I think people, some folks get in a trap of having to shoot a trophy buck every time. That's a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a lot of pressure. Uh, as I said, I can shoot a six point swamp buck in Alabama, and I'm just as excited as that as I'm shooting 170 inch deer somewhere else. So, I think you got to put it in perspective of you know, just don't get in the trophy trap because that's just a lot of pressure, and you know. Depending on where you hunt, if you got plenty of time, you got. I know those boys in the Midwest. They, I mean, they got all season to hunt. They get on here. I mean, what we're doing, we're probably going to ten or fifteen locations with five days. So we try to shoot a mature buck, you know, whatever it is. And if we don't, then um, you're just watching a show. But we don't have to shoot a deer. And I said I've missed enough deer to make the show entertaining. And and. Uh, I'm proud of that. I just, you know, my daddy said, if you're going to be the best, I'll be the best. I've been, I've been pretty good at missing deer. So uh, that's just me. I, I just went the entertainment route. I'm not the big buck expert and all that stuff, because there's a lot more folks out there that know more about deer hunting. Than me now. I mean, I'm no rookie at it. I've learned a lot and I've made a lot of mistakes and, uh, but I've learned a lot and a lot of small things. And when I play professional tennis, it's the little bitty tips that make the difference. Uh, I remember I could, and I was left-handed, and being left-handed as a tennis player is an advantage, but I didn't have a left-handed serve. And uh, I, my dad had me teaching people, trying to teach me how to do this. And one guy told me how to throw the tennis ball up in the same spot. And when he showed me that one trick right there, I went from nothing to 125 in the world. And the same thing I applied to deer hunting. 
I had no clue. I didn't care about the wind. I, I had in my mind where I was going hunting the next morning. And I had an older guy that was in my hunting camp. I said, where are you going? This is the night, but where are you going? I don't know yet. And I just thought he was just telling me that because he didn't want me to know where he was going. But he would get up each morning. And he'd go out and check the wind. Then he would make his decision. My decision was already made the night before I was going. And I was wondering why he always shot a deer during the weekend. And, you know, most of us did. It was a basic fundamental. And everybody asked me, what is the one thing a deer hunt? You know, you can, you can read all the want to read and this and that. It's the wind, number one. If you know the wind direction and you know where the deer are bedding and you know where they're going and know how to get in and get out without them knowing you're in there, you're going to be successful. And once I learned that one little tip, man, it was like, man, I'm starting to get pretty good for an old redneck from Alabama, you know. But wind was number one for me. Well, it's it's interesting. We, we, me and my buddy Jake, we do the podcast pretty often. And one of the things that we try to do is just the saying, it's it's the kiss saying, the keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. I think there's a few just fundamental things that will radically change your success in the woods. And it just seems like you want to talk about an over-marketed to society. The hunting community is is no better in terms of you need this new thing this year. You need this new gadget. This is going to change everything. But there, I think you, you probably know better than anyone. There's a few things that are tried and true that are, that, those are things that work. You can ask any professional athlete, what is your success? Getting your basics right and keeping your routine the same. And if, if you don't have your basics right in hunting, I mean, I used to teach people tennis all the time. They, would, they wouldn't change, so they never got any better. You know what I'm saying? I could take somebody from scratch and show them the right thing. And they, boy, they go just like, same with deer hunting. If you're in your same old mode and you're, and you're hard-headed and your ego's getting in the way and you're not willing to change, you're probably not going to be successful. And that's what it was going on with me. Oh, I don't know. You know, Yes. And, you know, sure, everybody's got a new product. It's going to do this and that. But, I mean, it's, it's not rocket science. If, you, if you'll study, now you got these, you know, topo maps and aerial photos of really learning your property and then learning where the deer are and learning what your food sources are, when they're feeding on those food sources because that changes. Then knowing what happens when they start scraping and rubbing in the rut. It's, it's, a, it's a game which I thoroughly enjoy, and you can never – You'll never outwit them. I mean, but if you can get, if you got the knowledge, you can catch up with them. All you got to do is mess up one time. So that to me, being a, a former athlete is the challenge and the competitiveness in me. I, don't, I mean, white tail buck was kicking my butt, you know, 99 out of a hundred times, but I didn't have my basics right. So that's, that's the cool thing about the sport. Now, whether you're bow hunting, whether you're muzzle loader hunting, whether you're rifle hunting, I mean, I mean, your scouting and bow hunting has got to be a heck of a lot tighter than it is on a muzzleloader and on a rifle. So you just got to, and I always say this, and you know, I don't like to hear all the nana, you know, between the compound bows and the, you yeah. know, the, the other bow. I always say, y'all stop, muzzleloaders, flint, and all that. Enjoy the sport. Pick the weapon of your choice and go out and enjoy it. Don't worry about whatever the people say, okay? It's your sport. Enjoy your time out in the field. It's that simple. Yeah, it is that simple. I mean, I think a lot of people think that you pick up the compound bow for the challenge. The only reason I picked up a compound bow ever was because you could hunt 90 days a year in Oklahoma. I didn't yeah. I, didn't, I didn't give a rat's that it was with a bow. It was yeah. just that you could hunt 90 days. That was it. Yeah. And I tell you, a bow, you got to be perfect. And that's the cool thing about it. You've got to play. And think about it. Think about the, our Native Americans. They're the ones that are doing this way before we were. And, you know, they've got, you know, making string bows and making that broadhead. you got to place that arrow in the perfect spot, okay? You can get away with some stuff with, the, you know, with a 250-grain bullet or slug or something like that. But that arrow has to be placed perfect to make that uh you humane shot. And that's, that's a cool thing. You got to get closer to them. Now, Hey, my deal is, and I'm, they got bows that people can shoot out to hundred yards. I always say, don't shoot. If you can shoot a pine plate out there at 20 yards and put all 12 shots in it, and you can only hit five at 30 yards, then don't shoot at 30 yards. Shoot at the, shoot at the range that you're confident at. And you know, during practice, you can make it work. You owe it to the animal number one. And uh, if you can't, don't have the shot, don't take the shot. But, 
I've really enjoyed the bow hunt, but I, I enjoy all weapons. I mean, you know, now crossbow hunting, you know, I've, I've never crossbow hunted, you know, and that was really taboo 30 years ago. You know what I'm saying? Cause everybody was arguing about this and that, but you know, there's a lot of disabled folks now that got a chance to get out into the field with a crossbow and, you know, they're still 30, 40 yards the way I look at it. Cause they do make a bunch of noise and stuff. And they're, they're not easy to take up into a tree stand. You need a rest. So, uh, but the muzzle loaders, I've watched those go from, you know, just the old Flint to, to the end line. You know, now you got these rifles, now you got scopes and stuff. So it's been really cool watching technology grow, but I just say pick your weapon, enjoy it, get out. And, you know, you got some folks, they just like to walk in the woods and come back and cook. They hadn't shot a deer in 20 years. Well, yeah, every camp's got to have a camp cook. So I'm always encouraging them, and that that means they're going to save a deer for me because they're not going to shoot one. So, uh, but, <laughs> but have fun with it. That's that's the thing. We got a great sport. We got about 11 million people enjoy it. And I always said, if 11 million people would take one person, we'd have 22 million. But that's just people. And that's why I said Share the Hunt USA, this new program we're starting, is something I think everybody should get involved with. And uh, taking somebody out and watching them feel the same exact way you felt when you shot your first deer, I promise you it'd be the most rewarding thing you'll ever do. Yeah, I agree with you. Is Are you – you know, being able to see so much of what's happened over the last 40 years, are you encouraged where we're heading as a hunting community? Are you discouraged? Are you neutral? How do you feel about the general direction that we're going? I'm positive. I'm a positive person. I tell you the thing that's most exciting, the fastest growing part of our sport are getting the ladies out. Women's license sales have improved probably 25 to 30%. You know, let's face it. This is kind of the old men's club. We're not going to invite mama to go to the hunting camp and this and that. This boy, that's a weekend out. Well, those mm-hmm. times have changed because now this world, you got so much limited time to spend with your family and your kids and stuff that it's becoming more of a family sport than uh, I could say 30 or 40 years ago. And I think that's very important. But I think we got a bright future. But uh, as I said, we've got to do some right things because, believe it or not, in this crazy political world we live in, hunting and fishing could be voted out sometime, you know what I'm saying? And that, that would be a sad day. So I hope people and, you know, look at who you're voting for as Democrat or Republican who like the outdoors and like gun rights and stuff. Those are the folks who can make the decision on, on, on the future. So, and I hope my grandchildren and them can still enjoy the sport and it's still available for them. But, uh, you know, as far as technology, good God, you know, I don't know what's coming next, but it's been an interesting deal to watch. I can tell you that. Yeah. The, uh, I was watching the the committee meeting of the Kansas parks and wildlife department when they were bad and trail cameras on public land. And it, mm-hmm. it made me feel a little helpless in terms of how easy it is to radically change something across a vast landscape with no input from hunters. Yeah. yeah. It's scary. It is scary. So I use trail cameras now more for security than I do anything. You know, security and hunting camps and stuff like that. I mean, you know, this technology is crazy. So uh, you just got to know how to use it and use it wisely. And I just trust all our game and fish guys. That, that's what they do for a living. And uh, they do a wonderful job. And they've got kind of, uh, they're like a referee. Nobody says great job. You know, they always holler and scream at them. But they've got, I, I've got a lot of good friends that are game wardens. And uh, to see what they do and, you know, they risk their life going out, you know, each night doing stuff. So kudos to all the game and fish guys. And if they tell you you only need to shoot one deer or maybe you need to take the season off on a species, then I think we should listen to them. Well, uh, they're experts. I'm not. But I sure believe in what they do. And we've been very proud to have game and fish as part of one of our spokes of our wheel of what we've been doing at Buckmasters. Yeah, I, I agree with you. We got – me and my wife got stopped last year hunting Kansas on public land. And the guy was like, sorry to bother you. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm glad somebody's out here doing this because yep. if you're not doing anything wrong, you have nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about at all. And, it, and he didn't come in there and interrupt my hunt. He just waited till I got back to the truck, checked the license. And I was on. And I was like, that makes me feel better about the areas that I'm hunting when somebody is a watchful eyes is, is around. Sure. You know, it's unfortunate in anything in life. There's people that are just not going to do it right. And that's just, they want a shortcut and it's unfortunate. And that's why we've, you know, that's why they have rules and penalties and things like that. So there's two ways to do things. You can do it the wrong way or the right way. And uh, if you pick the right way, you won't have any problem. Pick the wrong way. Well, you're going to get in trouble. 
Yeah, that's true. I, I would I wanted to talk about a little bit about the the your scoring system before we go. And what was the what's the motivation for the the Buckmaster scoring system? And maybe for folks that don't understand it, what what is the difference between it and other scoring systems? Well, what it is, uh, Russell Thornberry, uh, who was the Buckmaster's editor of the Whitetail Magazine for what twenty something years, he came up with this scoring system. And basically, it's pretty simple. I mean, you know, you got Ben Crockett, Pope and Young, and you know they're there. They're never going to go anywhere. But what what they're what they're rated on is perfect symmetry, and there's so many deer that have been left out of the record book because of perfect symmetry. Okay, so what we wanted to do is kind of be the redheaded stepchild of deer scoring and give everybody's redheaded stepchild out there that didn't make the record book a chance to make a record book. So that's what we did, and you know what the deer what the deer grows. It's what it should score. That's what it does. It's called full credit scoring system. So, and we do have non-typical categories and stuff like that, but basically it was an alternative to not having perfect symmetry. You know what I'm saying? So if you've got a nine point, you know, a huge nine point, well, that nine point's coming off because it's got to come back to be an eight point. You know what I'm saying? You know, it's just, that's what it was designed for is to give more deer. And we've got, what, 18,000 deer in our record book, man? That's how many deer that probably wouldn't have made. Now, a lot of them made both of them, made Pope and Young and made Ben and Crockett. But, you know, those guys are good guys. They've got a great scoring system. And this is just an alternative of it. And we've got a lot of scores across the country that uh, that are part of the BTR, Buckmaster Trophy record book. So it's been fun to watch. But we know we've, we've brought in a lot of folks that normally wouldn't have made the other ones. And it's kind of an alternative. What are the, what are the minimums for your scoring system? I think I was, you know, you, I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> 105, 104, or 105 for both. Okay. And 140 for rifle. Okay. But what we don't do is we don't put the inside spread on ours because you can't measure air. Okay. We put it in our, our composite score for our non, you know what I'm saying, for the gross amount. But mm-hmm. your net amount is like, it's one, what is it, 120, 125 for, for Pope? Pope yeah. 125. Okay. Ours is 105. Okay. But we take the inside spread out, which most of them are 16 inches. So we, you, you'll get more folks in on that way. So that's what, and again, it's not to take anything away. We don't want Pope and Young or Boone to go away because they're not. They, they started all this stuff. This is just an alternative way of bringing in some deer and let them get some recognition that they deserve because God, that's what they grew. That's what they should be scoring. Yeah, you hear it all the time. You hear nets are for fish. I hear a lot of people saying that. Um, and I I remember a couple of years ago, I shot a buck on public land, 131 inch eight. He's got an eight, eight or a nine inch eye guard on one side, and he's got a one inch nub on the other side. And I said, well, it might as well have been a one inch nub when it comes to the scoring. But exactly. he, he grew it. So yeah. he did. Well, credit scoring system. So send it in. We'll score. And you'll get you a little piece of paper. There we go. There we go. Well, for uh, for folks that um, want to keep up with you guys, maybe watch the show, um, the magazine, just everything that you guys are doing, where's the best place for them to uh, to do that? Well, buckmasters.com will get you everything you need to know. We're on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. We're, we're doing all the social medias. If you want to watch the TV show, we're in our 37th year. We're on the Outdoor Channel. And uh, that's on starting now. The original just started uh, a couple weekends ago. So we're on the Sunday nights, 10 o'clock Eastern, Saturday mornings, 9 o'clock Eastern. And we got some friend ta- French times in there too. So, uh, but if you never subscribe to the Buckmasters magazine, we'd love to have you. Uh, we've got both the print and the digital. And we've got a great social media team out there doing some cool stuff. I'm doing some podcasts. Like I said, enjoy doing yours today. So, but buckmasters.com. That'll tell you everything you need to know. If you want to subscribe to the magazine, we'd love to have you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jackie. I really appreciate it. Well, my pleasure and good luck. And tell everybody out that way I said hello. And uh, good luck to you this hunting season. Tell your wife uh, you need to go and get the rest of those bears shot, okay? That's right. Thank you guys so much for checking out the Hunter's Advantage podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, make sure to leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcast, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to the podcast. Thank you guys so much, and we'll see you in the next episode.